Um, we've been going through a series in Acts over the last sort of 18 months, doing a few chapters, going away, coming back, keeping it going. Um, we've been away for a couple of weeks. So we've had some other amazing teaching. It's been really great to catch up on that. Just this is last week. And I uh, just really want to express my thanks to all those folks who have just, I, just, I, was, I, was, I was tuning in and I was thinking, what's that? I was watching, I was thinking, God, they, they do really well. They, they're great. They're really great. I feel a bit redundant, you know. <laughs> you know, you want to go away and see people struggling without you. But no, they're awesome. No, you don't want to see that at all, of course. Fantastic. Thank you to Richard. Thank you to Julie. Thank you for everyone who led and, and uh, led worship and led the services. It was really, really great to, uh, to see you guys uh, and, and hear what you had to share and everything. Um, anyway, I'm back. Sorry. We're picking up in chapter 16. And uh, in chapter 16, I'm doing, doing the first sort of 10 verses where it deals with Timothy's circumcision. And it talks with, about the Holy Spirit blocking uh, the root of, of Paul and Simon, Silas and Timothy into certain places. They, the Spirit prevents them from visiting certain places. So with apologies for my sense of humor, I'm calling this message Cuts and Closures. It's good to be back. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The first part, cuts. You can follow along in your Bible or you can read it on the screen, hopefully. Yeah. Paul went also, Paul went on also to Derby, which is Derby, which is in the north of England, isn't it? We know that. We established that last time. Or it's the Midlands, you know, so it's north of Chichester, so it's north of me. Um, to Derby and uh, Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, uh, and he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went, town, went from town to town, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached. Remember last time, the decisions that were reached in the Council of Jerusalem? I'll come back to it. The, uh, the, the observance, that, uh, them for observance, the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. Hold on one minute. Imagine the scene. Paul comes to Timothy. Timothy. Hi, Paul. Can I just say, you're doing a great job. Everyone, we're just chatting with Silas and all the folks around here agree. You are being such a great witness. You're doing such a great job. God has got his hand on you. So what we want, me and Silas were just talking, what we want, we'd like you to come with us on the rest of this missionary journey. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to, uh, Paul, that's amazing, that's fantastic, I'm, I'm blown away, that's no problem, you, you richly, richly deserve, God's really got his hand on you. So what we're going to do is we're going to circumcise you, and then if you just pack your bags, tell your folks where we're going, then we're going to be going on through, through the middle of Asia Minor, we're going to be ministering to all the communities, we come there, it's going to be fantastic, it's going to be fantastic to have you along. Paul, amazing, really blown away, such a privilege. Can I just, just take you back a second? Take you back. Something, something you just said, I'm, I'm probably being silly. Um, the whole circumcision thing? Uh, yeah, absolutely, no problem about that. We can circumcise, we can do it this afternoon if you like, absolutely no problem. Um, so you just get yourself packed, get yourself ready, we'll be heading off ministry, be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm probably being silly. Take you back again, take you back again, the whole circumcision thing. Um, didn't we just have a big conference in Jerusalem where we went because of all those people who wanted all the believers to get uh, circumcised? And uh, we went to Jerusalem. We had a chat. You know, remember Peter? Oh, yeah, I remember. That was, that was good. We had a good time. Yes, it was fantastic, wasn't it? Uh, and Peter was there and all the apostles and James and John and all the rest of it. And we had a good chat. And they decided that there were just going to be those four rules. There's something about, you know, blood and, you know, not taking food, sacrifice to idols and, and doing all that sort of thing and immorality. And that was, I don't I remember. I thought the whole point was that we weren't going to get circumcised I do I do remember I remember you, weren't you the other day writing that letter to those folks in Galatia and you seemed a bit grumpy about the whole issue to be honest you seemed a bit a bit anti maybe that's how the scene played out we'll never know or Timothy said yes of course grab that knife time out time out this is one of those instances where you're reading the Bible and you can just go, oh, yes, here are some verses. I'm reading the Bible. I'm reading some more Bible. Here's some more Bible. It's like, no, 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 stop. This is weird. And we need to say, what's going on here? What's happening? 
Remember, this is the context. They have been, they've just had a whole conference where the thing was vigorously debated about what parts of the law of Moses they needed to follow. And Paul, from the absolute outset, along with Silas, very much against the whole, the whole circumcision as being part of something you needed to do to be a Jesus follower. Um, and actually, part of the reason they're now going around all the churches is to give them the letter that describes the decision that they've reached. They don't need to follow the whole law of Moses. That's kind of the reason that they're going, one of the reasons. You know, if, if you, as I was just referring to, if you, if you read Galatians, it's not like Paul is ambivalent on this subject. It's not like he's kind of easy come, easy go. When, if you've read the, the, the letters to the Galatians, Paul is furious. He's just quick potted history. So we've gone from Acts, we were in Acts, now we're talking about Galatia, Galatians. It's in the New Testament, the Bible. I had to Google it myself, but you know, you're, I'm sure you know better than me. But if you read the epistle to the Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, Paul is furious because a, a, a party of people have come to that church, the church of Galatia, and they're now t- teaching the, the converts there that they need to be circumcised and they need to follow all the law of Moses. And he's furious about this. Um, a, couple of, a couple of choice excerpts from Galatians. Um, Paul writes, Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? I've underlined that part. He sees it as seeking human approval. Or am I trying to please people? If I was still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Pretty harsh words. He goes on in uh, in, in chapter 2. We ourselves are Jews by birth. Now bear with this. This is slightly complex reasoning. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. You can read that in quotes. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in, or the faith of, you can translate it either way, Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith, the faith in or the faith of Jesus. Again, you can translate it either way. And not by doing the works of the law. Because no one will be justified by the works of the law. And then he makes quite an interesting point. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Just explain that a little bit. What he's basically saying is if if our faith in Christ, if we're putting our faith in Christ, we don't need to follow the laws, then then if, if that's what we're doing, if that's making us sinners, if that's what people are saying, that because you're putting your faith in Christ and not in the works of law, you're now sinning, then by that logic, Jesus is making us sinners. Jesus has become an agent of sin. Jesus, The faith of Jesus is creating sin in us. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? No, certainly not. He carries on. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, build up again the things I once tore down, he's talking specifically about circumcision, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live is... In the flesh, I live by faith, not the flesh. In the Son or of the Son of God. I live in the faith in the Son of God or the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. If you can follow the argument there, can you see what he's saying? He's saying, look, if Jesus, if we don't need Jesus, if we, if we can be justified, if we can be made righteous, it's the same expression, if we can be made right with God through the works of the law, we already had the law. What was Jesus doing? Why did we need him? Why did he come? If, is, is this your logic? He's arguing with the Galatians. He carries on in uh, chapter 6. Again, this is all in Galatians. I'm just trying to set the scene for you for how much Paul is against this whole thing. It's the people who want to make a fine showing in the flesh who are trying to force you into getting circumcised for this purpose only, that they may avoid persecution for the Messiah's cross. He's saying, you know, it's all about looking good. People are trying to make you look good so you look like you're following the law. It's about making a showing in the flesh. It's not about what's really happening inside. And then finally he says, 
about these people who are urging circumcision. If only they, they who are causing you trouble, or so, if only those who are making trouble for you would cut the whole lot off. Whoa, Paul, time out. Easy, easy. Getting a bit, getting a bit hot under the collar there. As I said before, Paul does not seem, if you read Galatians, thinking Paul's attitude to circumcision, he doesn't come across as kind of easy come, easy go, however you feel. He, he sounds pretty furious about the whole idea. He seems very much against it on principle. So it's really strange when we read the story in Acts about him circumcising Timothy. Why would he acquiesce to that practice if this is how strongly he feels Does he do it for an easy life? Well, he seems to be saying in Galatians the exact opposite of that. He's not bothered about an easy life. He he sort of says, if you read Galatians in a bit more detail, he sort of says, look, if I wanted an easy life, yeah, sure, I would follow all the law. This is why I'm being persecuted, because I'm making a stand on this stuff. Very simply and very basically, I'm going to cut to the chase. It's really hard (laughs) to square what we read in Acts 16 with Paul's sentiments that we read in the book of Galatians. It's not straightforward. I'm not going to give you a magic answer this morning, but I do want to offer you a few thoughts, and hopefully somewhere in that, through the Spirit of God, we'll get some, we'll get some wisdom, we'll get some understanding. Now, some will point out that the focus that Paul is making in Galatians is about you need to be circumcised. The idea, some people were saying that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. It's salvific. It's like, if that was the, the idea of the, what they call the Judaizers, the people who are trying to encourage the new converts to get, to get circumcised, it was like, you need to do this so that you can be saved. But you could say, well, that's not Paul's focus in Acts 16. Paul is not suggesting, he never suggests, that, sal- that uh, circumcision is necessary for salvation. But equally, he never says that being Jewish is a bad thing. In fact, he's keenly um, proud, if that's not the wrong word, of his Jewish heritage. He never says to the Jews, you need to stop being Jews. He never denigrates the the vast majority of, of what it is to be Jewish and to live a Jewish life. He's never against the Jewish people for being Jewish and following their traditions. And you could say the the problem in Galatians is that he's angry at Gentiles, Greek-speaking people, people from a a non-Jewish background, those people being told they have to go through this ritual. But for the Jewish people, that's part of their tradition, that's who they are, that's a totally different subject. And Timothy, as we read, was half Jewish. He'd obviously gone through his life and not been baptized, uh, not been circumcised because his, uh, his, his father was a Greek man. He was obviously from a, a mixed Gentile Jewish background. And so he wasn't fully in either camp. And so this was his moment to say, no, I'm fully part of the Jewish community. And presumably that would help him to minister in the Jewish communities in which they went. He could go to the synagogue. He could be fully part of that Jewish world into which they'd be going as they travel through Asia Minor and the rest of the Mediterranean world. So you can say this is just a, it's kind of expedient. It's kind of a practical step. It's just helpful to Timothy so that he can fully minister. And, you know, when we think about Paul's attitude that we read about in 1 Corinthians, where he says, you know, uh, to the Jews I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To the Gentiles I became a Gentile in order to win the Gentiles. Paul sort of has this flexible attitude to his, to his ministry and to his, to his evangelism. He's like, I'll do anything to connect with people. It's an amazing attitude, isn't it? I'd love to be that, I'd love to be that, that clever, for first of all. I'd love to, love to be, be that flexible to be able to connect with people. I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything in order to introduce people to Jesus. If I'm going to mix with the Jews, and we read this in spades, in Acts, you know, he's in amongst the Jewish world, and he's arguing from the prophets, he's arguing from the Old Testament, he's explaining to them, out of their own tradition, who Jesus is, and why he came. And then you will read uh, in the next chapter, Acts 17, when when he's in in Athens, and he's amongst a a Gentile uh, people, a, a, a Greek community with a Greek culture, He doesn't do any of that. He talks to them out of their own background. He quotes their poets and their uh, philosophers and that sort of thing. 
Paul is flexible. So we could see that this, what we're reading in Acts 16 about Timothy, is just another example of Paul's flexibility and willingness to do whatever it takes to introduce people to Jesus. That, that works. That kind of is a good argument as far as I can see. Whether that's all of it or not, I don't know. What I would say, though, and what, I, what we said last time as well, I shared a little bit as well, you can at least say this. The situation seems fluid. It seems like Paul, as we've just explored from 1 Corinthians, Paul is flexible. He's fluid. He's prepared to see what happens. He's prepared to roll with a few punches. He's prepared to do what it takes to try something, to explore something, and then see what happens. Sometimes our own approach to mission and evangelism can become or has become very kind of calcified and fixed. And this is the formula. And this is the process. And this is what needs to happen. And this is the prayer. And there might be nothing wrong with any of those steps. They might be really, really good steps. But there's also a time and a place to be flexible and to be fluid, to read the situation and to let the Holy Spirit of God lead us on not trying to uh, conform it to a particular pattern or rule. It feels like, as we go through Acts, the early church is working things out. And maybe it's okay for us to work things out as well. It's not always that there is a rule to be extracted and applied rigidly in all circumstances. There's something more organic, more mysterious, we might say, going on certainly something more spirit driven they're following where the holy spirit is leading okay that's one one thought one thought about what's going on another thought because you might read this and you might think isn't this just another example or you might have heard the accusation isn't this just another example of the bible being kind of inconsistent you know you've got something here that's different from something over there maybe it contradicts maybe and and again there's a there's can be a, a, a response within us to kind of argue and say no it's it's not inconsistent it's all exactly lined up and you can put all your ducks in a row and it's absolutely fine you can jump through all sorts of hermeneutical that's a nice big word isn't it hermeneutical hoops to try and make everything flow smoothly is this an example of scripture being inconsistent or muddled or kind of even patched together, maybe long after the event. Well, it depends what you think Scripture is. That's my my argument would be. It depends what you think Scripture is. If you think that the Bible is this kind of magic like repository of, of transcendent wisdom or transcendent rules or moral, moral teaching that, is, that you're meant to basically extract the rule and apply the rule. Extract the rule and apply the rule. It's like people, people have said... Um, you know, the Bible, it's like, it's like a Haynes manual. Remember Haynes manuals? This is, now, of course, you just Google everything and get a PDF. But back in the day, for you youngsters out there, you used to go to Smith's and buy a Haynes manual for the car that you just bought so that you knew how to, like, do stuff with it. You can tell how mechanical I am. Um, people have said, you know, the Bible is kind of like a Haynes manual, the, the instruction manual. And I understand where that argument comes from. I I know what people are are trying to say. I just think they're totally wrong. It's not. (laughs) The Bible is the collection of thousands of years of people's stories about their relationship with God. Very different people in very different places. First and foremost, it didn't float out of the sky bound with maps in the back. That wasn't how it came to us. It's, it's the collection of writings over thousands of years from very different people in very different places. So naturally, their stories are going to have different emphases and different, um, different content. It's their experiences, it's their revelation, it's their relationship with God. It might not be the most helpful thing to read the Bible as a textbook or, or even like a cookbook. You know, just find the recipe, read the rule, follow the rule. See, Joe cooks like this. Joe is a cookbook follower. It's like, and I try and step in and say, hey, let me help you. 
why don't we, why don't we chuck some, and I, I, I get into like the, the, I open up the, the cupboard and we've got all our herbs and spices above the, um, above the hob. And it's like, oh, we could chuck some garlic in. We were making a, a, a spag bol or something the other day. And it's like, oh, we should chuck some garlic in. We should chuck some herbs in. It's just like, no, that's not what the recipe says. Get back. Be gone. She cast me out of the kitchen. And I obeyed because I'm not stupid. Um, there's, there's, <laughs> I heard that, well, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> Lovely. It might not be the most helpful way to read scripture, to read like a cookbook. Like we just need to extract the recipe, we need to follow the recipe. The Bible, as we often say, is a living word. It's alive. How is it alive? It is alive through the Holy Spirit. You cannot read the Bible and get anything of value from it as a Jesus follower without the Holy Spirit. If you approach the Bible, and, and I, I remember when I was first at university, I had a, a lecturer who was probably one of the cleverest men I've ever met. He was an atheist, and he used to quote the Bible, but there was no life in it for him. He was one of the cleverest blokes I've ever met, but there was no life in Scripture for him because he had no faith. There was no relationship with the Holy Spirit to bring revelation and understanding. The classic way of reading the Bible, I'm sure many of you are aware of, is, is this thing called Lectio Divina. You've heard of that? Where you read the Bible and allow the Spirit to reveal something to you. It's great to read the Bible in a technical way. I have lots of commentaries. You can look at the Greek. You can look at the Hebrew. You can try and understand the historical context. Really, really valuable to give you background and to give you context. But you will not meet Jesus. You will not meet the Holy Spirit in the text unless you invite the Holy Spirit to meet you in the text. In relationship, it is a living word. A final reflection about this thing of Timothy's circumcision. On a totally different tack, I got something else you can take from this little bit of chapter 16. It's really, really clear that Paul and Silas and Timothy understand that there can be a cost involved in following Jesus. You know, I was joking earlier, making a bit of fun out of it, but there is no sense in which Timothy says, oh, hang on a second, I thought this whole Jesus discipleship business was just going to be plain sailing. Absolutely not. Just read what happens to those guys. We've already read a whole bunch of how Paul has been persecuted, beaten, left for dead. There is a cost involved in discipleship. There is some discomfort. Following Jesus, coming to church, if you like, being a Christian is not just about my personal comfort, my success, my needs being met. If, if that's our approach to following Jesus, well, because it's going to meet my needs, we're not going to be prepared for the cost that discipleship obviously involves. Especially in a consumer culture where everything is really about, you know, feeling better, you know, looking better, having more, being more successful. You know, the adverts that we've constantly received, receive. It's very easy to slip into that way of thinking. Sometimes the way that we share our faith, the way that we talk about Jesus, we can slip into kind of sales language like, uh, you need to follow Jesus because Jesus washes whiter. <laughs> Jesus makes you slim and attractive and good looking. Well, he has me. <laughs> Should have gone to Specsavers. Um, we, we can, we can like, you know, you need Jesus because Jesus is this product that's going to fix your problems. That's sales language. That's consumer language. And we need to be really careful about how much we use it in our evangelism. You know, the word disciple is very much linked to that word discipline. They have the same root. There's something about an edge. There's something about work. There's something about, you know, putting some effort in. You know, Paul never shies away from using, like, athletic metaphors for following Jesus. Military metaphors. You know, there's that sense, who watches programs like, oh, good, it's all gone wrong again. Awesome. It'll come back. Who, who enjoys those programs where they're like, you know, ex-SAS guys training people and putting through, put people through all sorts of like awful, awful things in order to be just maybe, you know, 10% as tough as those guys are? 
I, mean, I find them fascinating, especially the kind of mental side of how, that mental strength thing. But that's it. Paul never shies away from that kind of sense of, of athletic or military endeavor. You know, if you want to win the prize, if you want the gold medal, you've got to train. You've got to beat your body. You've got to work hard. You've got to get fit. You've got to be strong. You've got to be tough. That's all part of it. He doesn't shy away from those metaphors, and perhaps we shouldn't either. As you follow Jesus, as you seek to be filled by the Holy Spirit, is our approach, oh yes, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit because he's my comforter. And he is our comforter. Of course he's our comforter. That's the fantastic thing. The Holy Spirit is your comforter. He is my comforter. But my question is this, is that all he is? Is he just there to make me feel better? Or is he there to make me stronger in my spirit? Is he there to make me wiser in my spirit? Is he there to give me depth and strength and reserves and toughness so I can walk through this life and follow Jesus? Yes, even through the valley of shadow, as well as the sunlit uplands. Is that what the Holy Spirit is preparing you for and me for in our lives? Do you have the sense that you are pursuing something worthwhile and therefore something tough? Who's had that conversation? Maybe teenagers here, maybe your parents have had that conversation with you or maybe parents have had that conversation with their kids when it comes to like exam time and revision and all that we've just been through. If you don't study, if you don't put the work in, you're not going to get the reward. We know this is a life lesson, you know, deferment of gratification. Has anyone heard that expression before? You know, if you are prepared to put things off and work hard, then you will get the reward. Do you have that sense in your Christian life of pursuing something hard, of training yourself, of becoming spiritually tougher and stronger, more powerful, more capable, more focused, more faithful, less afraid, more forgiving, more loving, more able to deal with the slings and arrows of life? A sense of pursuing something that's actually quite elite, Something that's worth it. Like, you know, in those, in those sort of military programs at the end where they get that beret of whatever colour they're pursuing, of the red one or the green one or the sandy one, you know. And you know, flipping heck, that is a journey and a half. You, you have to earn that. Or if you get the gold medal, you have to earn that. You can't just rock up with a bag of chips and, you know. If you could, I would be Olympic champion. But you can't just rock up. It's the result of pursuing something elite. Anyway, enough said. Moving on. Very quickly, briefly, I'm going to go through the rest of um, these next five verses. So after that, they then went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia... They went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately uh, tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Something really interesting, I'm sure you noticed it in that. The Holy Spirit, it says, or the Spirit of Jesus, blocked their intended route really begs the question, I wonder what that meant. I wonder how, what that blockage looked like. Was it, was it kind of like a, a strong sense of conviction? Was it a prophetic word? You know, maybe one of the believers said, you know, God's saying, don't, you shouldn't do this. He doesn't want you to take this route. Or was it a whole bunch of just practical circumstances, you know, how these things rack up sometimes? You try it and planes get cancelled or flights, <laughs> that sort of thing. They obviously were going to travel easy jet and... No, was it a whole bunch of practical circumstances that stopped them being able to do these things? And they saw God's spirit in it. There's something to reflect on here about how God might be closing the doors to us sometimes in our lives. I'm sure you've had this experience. You were pursuing something. Maybe you were pursuing something that seemed really, really good, that was good. It was a good thing. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing. But for whatever reason, it wasn't right at that time. Or do you ever find yourself reflecting on what might have been? 
the regrets you have. Maybe you regret, maybe you worry about the decisions you didn't make, the road not traveled. Here, God leads them when they reach their fork in the road. God leads them in a different way, in a perhaps a less expected way, an unexpected way. He takes them to Macedonia, which is a more Romanized part of the world. It's deeper into the Gentile world. It's farther away from their home, their home church, their home culture. It's a riskier path, maybe a bolder path. It requires perhaps a bigger leap of faith, a bigger departure from where they were. It wasn't what they were expecting. They were expecting that this is the road and this is the obvious road and we just carry on. But no, God had something else in mind. And it seems that this new direction opened up for them really quickly. You know, it makes it sound like it was that night. Paul had a a vision. No, don't do that. Do this. Wouldn't that be nice when the door is closed to us? Wouldn't it be nice to have that clarity about the route that we should be taking so immediately and so quickly? But as we know, sometimes life, perhaps often, life doesn't work like that. Sometimes we have to stumble in the dark for a little bit and just trust that God is leading us. Sometimes we only get the clarity that Paul had about Macedonia. We only get that clarity later, don't we? Ever had that experience where maybe a year, five years, ten years later, you're able to look back and go, wow, that experience was really tough. It was really awful. I didn't know which direction to take. It was really confusing. But now I can see. We often see better, as I often say, in the rearview mirror. And the other point is the vision asks for their help. The Greek word literally means, means to aid or to relieve. The gospel should be a discernible help to people. And certainly that includes acts of compassion, acts of love, acts of service. The gospel should feel like good news, I honestly believe. It should feel like help. The vision says, come and help us. Come and relieve us. Come and aid us. But in our culture, I also, as I, as I read that and as I think about that, I'm not just thinking about the practical stuff like giving homeless people shelter or, or, or hungry people food. I'm also thinking about the sense of release that comes from the darkness of our age, from the... From the um, idols of our culture, from the burdens and the darkness and the confusion that seems to be going around in our culture where we don't know who we are and we don't know where we're going. I've been talking about that a lot over the last few messages. The cultural religion we have in 21st century Britain needs to be confronted by the way and the truth and the life of Jesus. That is part of declaring the good news too. In conclusion, these chapters, they continue the theme of how the gospel spread into a wider culture. You've got Jesus, the Messiah of the Jews, his message, his announcement suddenly impacting a world that has got no grid for this, no background, hasn't got the language, hasn't got the experience, hasn't got the scripture. And the church are kind of working out what that means. Can anyone see perhaps some parallels for how we might share the gospel in our culture. A culture that has really lost its grid. Or it has a grid. It thinks it knows what Jesus is all about and has decided that it's not interested at all. We need to find our way afresh. We need to find those ways, like the early church did, of ministering salvation in many and varied ways. The situation is fluid. We are learning as we go, just like they were. We're often playing catch-up to where the Holy Spirit is already at. The Holy Spirit's ahead of us. We don't keep him in our back pocket. He's out there already doing it, and we're playing catch-up. But they were too, as we've read time and time again. The Holy Spirit goes before us.